Everyone's equal in the sky, but on the ground we like to stand out. Don't miss out on this unique opportunity to buy our cool Iron Match. Follow the link right now and be the first everywhere! Air disasters. On the 5th of May 2019, a Sukhoi Superjet 100, managed by Aeroflot Airlines, crashed at Sheremetyevo Airport. The aircraft was scheduled to fly from Moscow to Murmansk. Upon its return back to Moscow, the plane had a number of rough landings that led to its significant damage and fire. 41 passengers died, whilst 37 managed to survive. Fifth of May 2019, Sheremetyevo Airport, 5.17 p.m. The crew prepares for the upcoming flight to Murmansk. Denis Evdokimov, a 47-year-old captain in command, is an experienced pilot with over 6,800 flight hours. Prior to Superjet 100, he flew the IL-76 as border control and Boeing 737 managed by Transaero. After the company collapsed, he joined Aeroflot. First officer, 36 years of age, graduated from flight school only three years ago, then took additional courses at Aeroflot and completed them only half a year ago. Aeroflot 149 to Sheremetyevo delivery, добрый вечер. Clear to Murmansk, runway 24 Central, Kilo November 24 Echo Departure. Traffic control provides them with a flight schedule. It is common practice at Aeroflot to communicate in English only. Today's scheme of departure is Kilo November 24 Echo, which means that after takeoff they have to change the heading by 180 and continue towards Kostina. Nevertheless, there is thunder right in front of them moving from left to right. After takeoff, the crew risks to end up right in the middle of it, then making a right turn and leaving it behind. Denis Evdokimov understands this. We just follow the flight plan, guy. At 5.57 p.m., they reach the runway and wait five minutes for permission to take off. Thunder is visible on the crew's radar. You see that thunder, right? It is strictly forbidden to fly into thunder, whilst maximum allowed proximity is 15 kilometers. First danger lies in the upward winds that can crush the plane like a match. Lightning, on the other hand, isn't that dangerous, and although most pilots steer off their way, these currents still manage to get them. Finally, the crew is granted to take off. Captain pushes the levers forward, engines reach their maximum thrust, and the plane takes off at 285 kilometers per hour. Captain engages the autopilot at an altitude of 210 meters. Knowing that thunder is right in front of them, Denis Evdokimov makes the turn a little bit earlier than scheduled. Maybe a little shaky. Ouch. We are fine. Half a minute later, lightning strikes the plane. Autopilot disengages and the plane switches to direct mode, the direct control. Direct mode is one of three ways to fly the plane. It requires manual control of flight via a side stick, similar to the ones used by Airbus. The captain has one on the left, whilst the first officer has his on the right. Direct mode implies that the computer won't smooth out the aircraft's reactions the way it does in standard mode. More so, the plane becomes extremely sensitive to controls and feels less stable. Smoothness is the key in direct mode, and once conquered, it allows for long, easy flights. Captain's first move is to tilt side stick half to the left, then half forward. His further actions become impulsive, where he changes side stick position over 10 times within 18 seconds. Hence, there is no reason for the flight to be cancelled. 
It is true that some limitations arise with direct mode, but they aren't critical, and flight can be continued. Denis Evdokimov, on the other hand, decides to land immediately. First officer tries to communicate the emergency to the traffic control, but doesn't succeed. Radio isn't functional. The crew initiates code 7600, which stands for loss of radio, making the plane change color on the screens of traffic control radars. They now see that the plane can't be reached. The crew turns to secondary radio and finally reaches the tower on an emergency frequency. Moscow approach, requesting return for 1492. We have lost radio and are flying in direct mode. Understood, 1492. Descend flight level 80. Aeroflot 1492, heading 057. Descend flight level 80. As of now, the whole flight is directed by vectoring, where the tower constantly provides new headings guiding the plane to the runway. Superjet starts to descend. Captain calls out chief cabin crew. It's not an emergency, but we are going back. Air Lord 1492, do you need assistance upon landing? Not really, we just don't have radio and are flying in direct mode. The crew goes through direct mode checklist that stresses smooth handling and for speed brake to be fully engaged after landing. Tower grants permission to land but Captain asks for another go-around. It is then that he decides to pull into the wait zone. 1492, requesting permission for the holding pattern above Kilo November. This message was not registered on the tower radio, whilst the Captain never followed up on it. Altitude is 600 meters, and Denis Evdokimov struggles to maintain it in direct mode. His deviations are greater than 60 meters, which causes several alarms to go off. Gears and flaps are retracted, and the crew arms speed brakes, which are the planks above wings that lift up upon landing. When armed, they automatically engage upon touchdown, pushing the plane to the ground. Unfortunately, they do not engage automatically in direct mode and must be released manually. In fact, this has been mentioned by the first officer during the checklist reading. Set speed brake on full after landing. 20 kilometers away from the runway, traffic control puts the plane on its final heading. 11 kilometers after, the plane enters its glide path. This is where the final descent begins. Crew informs the tower that they will be approaching by eels. The ILS is an instrumental landing system of three types. First is when the plane lands on autopilot. Second is when the arrows on the screen direct the glide path. Third and the most difficult type is when there are no arrows on display but horizontal and vertical lines. It is the only type of ILS landing available during direct mode. Despite the difficulty, the crew manages to correctly guide the plane towards the runway. Crew goes through the landing checklist, but ignores the approach checklist that had to be executed prior to the landing checklist. There was so much that had to be discussed. Best way for approach, what can go wrong, how would they tackle emergencies? This would have aided the first officer to provide actual help during landing. Despite it all, our crew is rushing to land and they definitely aren't ready for it. The plane enters its glide path nine kilometers away from the runway. Dennis intentionally goes lower the path whilst the go-around altitude isn't set. Strong wind blows from the left at a 90 degrees angle and gusts are reaching 15 meters per second. This just adds to the difficulty of the situation. Airflot 1492, wind is 160 degrees, 7, gusts 10 meters per second, runway 24 left, clear to land. At an altitude of 335 meters, wind alarm goes off, stating its purpose is to notify that wind speed and its direction may change drastically. 
It is quite an unpleasant factor, since it may cause a plane to shift unexpectedly from set trajectory right before landing. System warns the crew to go around. As per instructions, they absolutely must comply. But if the captain sees no danger, it is okay to execute the landing. In these thunderous conditions, strong side winds and gusts rushing in all directions possible, Dennis baselessly ignores the alarm. By now they reach altitude 80 meters, and decision whether to land or not must urgently be made. Right at this moment, just as the alarm predicted, the wind changes and the plane dives below the glide path. The situation becomes extremely dangerous. Guide slope alarm goes off. Captain acknowledges the fact that they are below the set glide path, but still continues the approach. He has permission to do so. Still, things turn to worst as the eel's approach lines must be realigned once again. Captain increases thrust so to reach the runway. Engines spool off but not instantly. The speed increases and they get closer to the runway. Later this will become another reason of failure. They reach the runway at an altitude of 12 meters and a constantly increasing speed of 304 kilometers per hour, which is lower and faster than required. By now, altitude is 5 meters, speed 315 kilometers per hour, which is too fast but is still within the limits. System commands to retard, set low thrust. Captain obeys and levels the aircraft, although this had to be done much earlier. He pulls side stick half back, then forward and back again, moving controls right to their limits. As he pulls side stick fully back again, the chances of landing become extremely slim. They touch down 900 meters into the runway. A simultaneous landing on all three gears creates an overload of 2.55 G, which is too much. Speed brake does not engage automatically, as crew forgets that it has to be released manually. Brakes don't go up, and there is nothing to push the plane down. Resultantly, it bounces off the runway five feet up. Instructions state that at such bounce rate, the aircraft must go around and attempt landing once again. Dennis decides to land and engages reverse, but it doesn't go on, as the plane is still airborne. Side stick fully forward, and they rush back down again. Right before the touchdown, Captain pulls side stick back again, slamming the plane into the ground, front gears first, creating an overload of 5.85 G. By international standards, 3.75 G is an established limit for the gears. They begin to deteriorate, although fuel tanks are still intact. Aircraft bounces back up again, and given that the system registered a touchdown, reverse engine mode is engaged. Dennis decides to go around, pulls side stick back and sets full thrust. Nothing happens. Reverse is already active, and in these conditions, even instructions forbid to go around. It practically becomes impossible. For the third time, the plane slams into the ground at 258 kilometers per hour, reaching 5G. Half deteriorated gears get crushed. Tanks spill out fuel. The plane is on fire. Tower calls out all emergency services. The aircraft turns left and halts to a stop. Crew begins evacuation whilst a minute later engines stop. As per official reports, the captain was overconfident whilst operating in thunderous conditions. This resulted in a lightning strike and a situation that became too tough for the current crew. The main cause for the disaster was a failure to pilot the aircraft. It would have been much better if Captain was to choose another airport with better weather conditions. It was the strong gusts of wind that added to thunder that night at Sheremetyeva. 
Even fully functional airplanes always struggle with side winds at landing. Hence, it became a trap for an inexperienced pilot flying in direct mode. He definitely had to steer away from these conditions. Others would have managed such a landing, not Dennis. Training for such scenarios can only be done on a flight simulator. Past training results of other Aeroflot pilots showed similar fast reactions whilst piloting in direct mode. In this case, nevertheless, the captain rushed to land the aircraft without getting used to the specifics of flight and nuances of machines' reactions. Moreover, they missed pre-landing briefing and approach checklist. 21 minutes after being struck, the crew was already above the runway, which is very little time, meaning that most precautions were definitely missed out on. Fully loaded airplane, terrible weather conditions, and piloting in direct mode only increased the difficulty of landing, let alone the bouncing off the runway, which is hard to kill. Air Disasters This reconstruction is a video version of the official IAC report 